Hey everyone, today's video is going to be about esophageal cancer and the different types of esophagectomy. And really we're going to be focusing on esophagectomy primarily. Esophageal cancer is a very big topic. Uh, we could certainly do a whole series of videos on things like the workup or the TNM staging or basics of management. Uh, but for this one, we're really just going to focus on the several different types of esophagectomy because uh, for many medical students or junior residents, you'll be on a service doing these cases, and these cases are referred to by some obscure names as opposed to what actually happens. So I always found it hard to figure out, and uh, I hope this video can clarify some of those things for you. But before we really get into that, we have to understand a little bit about the anatomy and how that plays into the surgical management of esophageal cancer. So if you've ever done any scopes or seen any, uh, you probably know that we usually measure things from the upper incisors as zero centimeters. And then with that in mind, the stomach, and the, the GJ junction, or sorry, the EG junction is usually around 40 centimeters from the incisors. And so when we're talking about esophageal cancer, 20 is kind of the magic number where if you have an esophageal cancer more proximal than 20 centimeters, that patient actually cannot get surgery. They would get definitive chemo radiation. And thinking about it, you can imagine if you have this very proximal tumor, it would be hard to get a, a good proximal resection margin. You'd end up having to take out things like the larynx and the pharynx. That would be a very morbid procedure. And even if you could somehow get your proximal margin, you would have essentially no cuff uh, to make your anastomosis. So really just know 20 centimeters is the cutoff. Anything more proximal than that, you're not going to be doing an esophagectomy typically. Now, if it's distal, from kind of the 20 to 40 centimeter mark, then we can uh, think about esophagectomy as being a definitive therapy for this cancer. Of course, if the TNM staging is right, they don't have distant disease, et cetera. And again, when we're talking about the surgical access of the esophagus, the esophagus really spans essentially three body cavities. So it's kind of nicely highlighted here. We have the neck, we have the chest, and then below this, we have the abdomen. And depending on which level you're wanting to get access to the esophagus, uh, the side changes based on the level that we're talking about here. And so the way I like to think about this is we know that the stomach's on the left and the esophagus is attached to the stomach. So generally, the stomach is a left-sided organ and the esophagus typically is going to be a left-sided organ as well. And then if you know that, then you just have to think about marching left right, left. So we're just talking about neck. Surgical access happens on the left side if we're looking to get to the esophagus, but in the chest, access happens on the right side. And then in the abdomen, of course, the stomach's on the left, the esophagus will also be on the left. So left, right, left. Uh, the reason it's right in the chest is because the aorta runs on the left side of the esophagus in the mid-chest. Uh, so we have to make a right-sided chest incision to get access. All right, so we talked a little bit about the three spaces, neck, chest, and abdomen, when it comes to getting access to the esophagus. And when we are performing surgery, we're going to be getting access in one of these three spots, or usually multiple of these three spots. And so the neck incision is usually a left-sided neck incision. If we're making an incision in the chest, like I said, left, right, left, it's usually a right-sided thoracotomy, although you can do minimally invasive approaches where you would just do some port sites on the right. And then in the abdomen, uh, you can either do usually a midline laparotomy to get access to the stomach, or you could also do minimally invasive options uh, with just a few port sites. And so if I draw in the esophagus here, coming into the stomach, one common pimp question that gets asked in the OR is what is the main blood supply to the gastric conduit? So, of course, if we're doing an esophagectomy, taking out a portion of the esophagus, we're going to use the stomach to come up and bridge that space, and that's called a gastric conduit. Of course, you can, in certain cases, do what's called a colonic interposition, where you use the colon instead of the stomach. This is usually if they've had some sort of stomach resection in the past, but the vast majority of esophagectomies use the gastric conduit, so that's what we're going to focus on at this point. And so just to stop beating around the bush, the answer to that question is the right gastroepiploic artery that runs right here. That's the blood supply to this conduit. And you can remember that because when we do the resection to resect the esophagus from the stomach, it looks something like that. 
And so if we think about our two blood supplies where we have to the stomach, we have the gastric artery. So the right gastric would be here and the left gastric would be here. We also have the right and left gastroepiploic. So the right gastroepiploic is here and the left is here. And so, of course, if we cut the stomach along here and we bring this conduit up into the chest, it's actually going to be this part of the stomach that gets anastomosed up here. So, of course, the left gastroepiploic would have been cut and doesn't have access to its source anymore. But the right gastroepiploic maintains its blood supply up here through the left and that supplies uh, that distal end of your gastric conduit. So if you ever get asked, what's the blood supply uh, to the gastric conduit? Or while you're doing the case, what do we really not to in, not want to enter while we're doing our dissection of the stomach? It's that right gastroepiploic artery. All right, so I think that's enough about that. So we're going to talk now specifically about the really three types of esophagectomies that are done. And the first one we'll talk about is called a three-hole or a McCune, I believe that's M-C-K-E-O-W-N, McCune, but most people just call it the three hole. And as you can imagine, that just has all three incisions in the three spaces that we talked about. So a left side of neck incision, a right side of chest incision, and an abdominal incision, which is generally in the midline. Your other two types are two hole or two incision esophagectomies. So you can imagine we always need an incision in the abdomen because we need to create our gastric conduit. And so we can either then have an abdominal and a chest incision. That's called an Ivory Lewis esophagectomy. Or your other two incision esophagectomy, remember we always need that abdominal incision, would be the abdomen and the neck incision. And that is called a trans hiatal esophagectomy. And of course, just like we said before, remember that your abdominal incision and your chest incision can either be these big open laparotomies and thoracotomies, or they can be minimally invasive options in the chest, which would be VATS surgery, VATS, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, or laparoscopic surgery in the abdomen, depending on surgeon preference. So, Speaking of surgeon preference, really that's what's going to ultimately dictate which type of esophagectomy the patient gets. And you'll probably find that your institution has some practice patterns where you essentially do one, maybe two types of esophagectomy depending on the situation. But there's some classic pros and cons of the different types of incisions. You can imagine if you're making a neck incision and making a very proximal anastomosis, uh, you're gonna have to pull the conduit all the way up to that proximal location. There's probably a little bit of tension there and maybe a little bit higher leak rate when you make an anastomosis through an incision in the chest. But the advantage is that it's actually very easy to open up this incision and decompress that leak if it would happen and you're not having a leak down here in the mediastinum. Whereas you can imagine for a chest incision, if we're making our anastomosis in the chest, the conduit has less distance to travel, uh, there's probably a little bit lower leak rate. However, if a leak does happen, it's really hard to get to a leak in the mediastinum. You have a high risk of mediastinitis and really severe infection. Also, anytime you think about a chest incision, you can think about the amount of pain that people get with a thoracotomy and the amount of splinting they do and the risk for some pulmonary complications, especially pneumonia. Uh, but of course, when we skip the chest incision, right, we just do that transhiatal, we have other risks. If you don't have an incision in the chest, you can imagine that you still have to get through the chest. So you're doing blind dissection with your hand in the chest cavity, which if it sounds terrifying for you, that probably should. There's, of course, many important structures in the chest that you can damage when you're dissecting blindly. And you also probably get a worse lymph node harvest if you're doing a blind dissection. Um, but again, there are still advantages. Another advantage of the transhiatal is that you don't need uh, any single lung ventilation. And for example, a patient with some tenuous respiratory status. Then the final consideration is the anatomy of the tumor. So if we're drawing our esophagus and our stomach. Once again, uh, if you have a rather proximal tumor and you know you're gonna be needing to get a relatively high proximal margin and make a high anastomosis, it makes sense to have a neck incision to help you do that anastomosis well. So a proximal tumor, uh, you're probably going to be looking at either a three hole or McCune esophagectomy, 
uh, those are the same thing, three hole vacuum, or a transhiatal esophagectomy. But if you have a more distal tumor, you can really do any of the three. You can do your three hole, you could do a transhiatal, and you could do an Ivory Lewis, which once again, three hole, neck, chest, abdomen incisions, transhiatal, just neck and abdomen, and Ivory Lewis, chest and abdomen. Remember, we always need the abdomen. We always need to make uh, our gastric conduit through that incision. Uh, but the other two are somewhat variable and are ultimately going to come down to surgeon preference as well as a little bit about the anatomy of the tumor. And of course, finally, that last point, remember if you're above that, it should draw right here. If you're above that 20 centimeter line, uh, that patient is not going to get an esophagectomy. They're just going to get definitive uh, chemo radiation. All right, so that's it. Uh, remember these videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any disease. We'll see you next time.